The whole project grew of its own volition. It was Krishna's plan. It says in Chaitanya Charmita that if you put God first place, difficult things become easy. If you don't put God first place, easy things become difficult. Krishna wanted to do something miraculous. He wanted a plan, a world-class Krishna temple Mary that's 90% another religion. And so he did it. radio in Los Angeles for a number of years as the life membership director there and we wanted to buy a radio station so we could broadcast 24 hours a day but of course the LA market it was, it was too expensive and so we started monitoring the classified sections of broadcast weekly and after about a year I saw a small AM station for sale at a very low price with five acres of land near a major university and in some of the most beautiful country in America. So one thing led to another and we put a down payment on the uh, radio station in 82. It started it was wanting to come and just simply preach. We bought the radio station and people started coming and then we were able to build a house on the farm and get additional land um, and that way it expanded. But the entire 10 years, there was an adjacent eight and a half acre piece of land that was a little more elevated than the one that the radio station occupied. And so uh, we expected it to be sold out from under our feet at any time, but 10 years went by and it didn't sell. So finally, when the mortgage pay was paid for the initial piece of property, we inquired as to what it would take to annex this other seg segment. And uh, it, it uh, all fell together very easily though. It was owner financed, price was reasonable. Um, now we had from five acres, we went to 15. And we had a higher piece of land on which to build the present temple. <laughs> and one Sunday feast, I simply announced in the future we're going to build a temple. And immediately all the media were there, with the newspapers and televisions. Krishna's going to build it temple in Utah County. So then we saw they wanted us to do this, so let's try. So the temple went up mainly by donations, people helping, working free of charge, and uh, by working very hard ourselves, raising funds. We sold a lot of cookies, <laughs> we put on a lot of festivals and events, and somehow or other the funds came in. plans in the late 90s, but I think most of the construction was like 2000, 2002, like that. We opened 2001, but we didn't have domes and arches and so on. We opened with a very simple construction, and then we added the uh, details, the decorations, as we were able to raise funds. And from start to finish, it only took about three years to construct it from 98 to 2001. When we opened in 2001, we had about 5,000 people, mostly friends and neighbors. Senator Orrin Hatch came. The present governor, Gary Herbert, was here. Uh, a lot of luminaries all came together to celebrate this wonderful temple in Utah Valley. One of our very dear oldest friends, Roshan, from Southern California, uh, his particular favorite thing to do in the world is bring Krishna to different locations. So he has an import business, and along with importing all his clothing and this and that, he also imports beautiful deities from Jaipur. So 
he donated Radha Krishna, Sita Ram Lakshman Hanuman and Gauri Nitai. Just like the temple itself, uh, the temple proved its own volition. Similarly, the Holy Festival. We were doing our own private Gopanima festival uh, before the temple was constructed in our log house when we had our Chaitanya deity. And then one of our members, Yogi, he came with some gulal and we dressed Lord Chaitanya in white and put some color on him because it was holy the same day. We started off with just a few people and we did it indoors, which was a big mistake. Six weeks later, I was still cleaning gulal out of the cracks of the floor with a toothbrush. And then we took it outside on the deck of the house. And then the next year, so many people, from 10 people, we had 100 people. Then from 100, we had 1,000. And then we had 10,000. And at that point, we realized we'd better try and organize it. I think the success of the festival grew um, the more we worked on the music. Mm -hmm. Colors is, was certainly a hook, something to draw people in, but needed something more than that. And uh, sometime around 2007 or so, um, I started concentrating on the music, even bringing in some bands from Los Angeles and Denver and places like that. In those days, we had a cultural program too. We'd have dancers, classical dancers, as well as bands. And we had one big throw at noon on Saturday. And then the crowds began to grow from 3,000 to 10,000. So then we had two throws, one at noon and one at 4 p.m. And then the crowd grew beyond 10,000 and we started having hourly color throws. It's a wonderful way of uh, interacting with the public. We're relaxed, we're having fun, we're accepting each other unconditionally, and we're chanting the names of God all day long. That's basically what Kirtan does. Kirtan um, uh, causes any differences, or distinctions, or ethnicity. Um, to, to disappear and, and you relate as spirit soul, one living being to another. I think people come here and because of the kirtan and the universalism, the non-sectarianism, they feel comfortable, they feel at home, they don't feel like they're judged, they don't feel like they have to perform up to a certain standard, they get accepted as they are. The whole thing about the holy uh, is the chanting. People go home completely elevated. They had a great day. They didn't take any intoxicants or eat any meat or allow any smoking in the area around them. Everybody felt clean and purified and the chanting went on for hours and they say it's, it was the best day of my life. My husband does the advertising a month or two ahead. We bring in some volunteers a week or two ahead to start setting up things. Three or four days ahead we do the setup and the cooking and make sure everything's you know, in good shape. So it doesn't take that long. We have a lot of volunteers. We get volunteers from volunteermatch.com. There's a local website, justserve.org. We couldn't do it without the volunteers. But most of what leads up to the festival day is done by us, the permitting, the uh, social media, putting up posters, passing out flyers, uh, organizing the farmers, uh, arranging the combination of motels, transportation, air flares, rental cars. Um, everything up to the festival day is done by me and my wife. And then the festival day, of course, you need about 200 volunteers to process the people at the admissions gate, 
to um, sell the collars, to do the food distribution, um, as well as to keep people engaged from the stage. A lot of school tours make this their destination. We have about 3,000 school kids on official school tours who arrive in the yellow buses, do yoga, see a PowerPoint about the culture and the philosophy, do kirtan, have lunch. From the beginning, we realized that we would be successful if we uh, became a cultural resource for schools and families, for festival venues. And uh, we've been very successful in uh, making ends meet and keeping things together. The animals is very much part of our, our presentation. We have uh, many dozens of field trips throughout the year. Thousands of people come, all the school children come, every school sends classes. We have classes 20 to 100 people at one time. And it's the atmosphere of the temple. They, they learn about the chanting. Sometimes they have lunch and everything too. And they take prashad. Um, and they also get to see the farm and all the animals. And we teach them about the nature of the soul. People have not realized that animals are souls. That they're the same as we are. We teach them that all are equal. It doesn't matter whether you're human or an animal or a tree or a bug. Whether you're uh, this religion or that. Whatever your nationality is. We teach them that we're all souls. And we have different bodies and respect to the soul is what is very important. And so many of the children have become vegetarian and come here also because they begin to see, I love these animals. You see the dance of peacocks, they love the parrots, they pet the llamas, take them for walks and brush them. They see the gorgeous cows that are so cute. And uh, their hearts change. So that's the idea of the atmosphere. Um, in season, the place is really full of birds and beautiful trees and different plants and vegetables that we grow. So it's very attractive to be in the atmosphere of nature, surrounded by the beauty of the hills and so on in the, in the distance, and uh, just relief from the stress of city life, and uh, uplifted by the spiritualism of the atmosphere. As I said, uh, we're well established here in Utah Valley as a resource for school kids, as a uh, tourist attraction and a festival venue. If we can just continue that, that will be as much as we could wish for. Um, Salt Lake City is in an urban center where there's more diversity. Uh, there's a lot more heterogeneity in Salt Lake City, and so. What we've seen in the six years since we acquired the Salt Lake property is some very good devotees emerge who are practicing quite seriously. So there's much more of a core devotional community in Salt Lake City than there is here. Um, and there's a lot of potential for expansion and for growth there. The two samples complement each other. What the one does, the other doesn't do. What the other doesn't do, the other one does. They go hand in hand quite nicely, I think. Building a temple, installing the deity in the city is very beneficial. Um, so a lot of people, they'll go to that temple and to this one because of the different atmospheres. And one is more convenient, the other has a certain flavor to it. If there's a message to the devotional community that this temple conveys, it is that everybody's a devotee. We, we make a big mistake, I believe, in limiting what other people can do for Krishna consciousness. Sometimes we insist that they be on an exalted standard before we'll even acknowledge their validity. But the fact is that anybody in any situation of life can perform devotional service. 
and will perform devotional service if they get the right encouragement. Everybody is capable of doing something for the Lord, but we have to do our part, which is to see them as uh, parts and parcels of the Lord, not see them in terms of how exalted or how advanced they are, how many rounds they chant or how much money they give, but just see them as, as devotees, their parts and parcels of the Lord. It's our job to make it easy, to make devotional service accessible. And sometimes we make it hard. Sometimes we build walls and we insist on standards, which keep most of the world out. And the result of that is that we'll be a small fringe community, which will never have a meaningful, spiritual, purgatory impact on society in general. We're getting old. We're not like our Guru Srila Prabhupada, who really started his mission at our age. Uh, We've been devotees almost 50 years, and so we want to pass on the baton, so to speak. We want to have enough people that are trained up that can continue the uh, mission and expand the preaching um, without it falling down or going backwards in any way. We have our radio station here, we have our Pashadam distribution going on. There's so many more things that can be done. The starting college programs. So hopefully um, people will take it up and we can back out slowly and enjoy the last uh, impression of Krishna that we somehow have been fortunate enough to establish. <laughs>